Pablo Aguilero from MIT um, so coming here to give us uh, the uh, uh, talk. Uh, so Pablo was grown up, uh, uh, grew up uh, in Spain, uh, Valencia area, and went through the University of Valencia for his bachelor, de bachelor degree, and then decided to come to the States afterward, and he did a master of science in the University, uh, uh, University of California in San Diego. Right, San Diego. And then, uh, somehow he always thought that that's probably enough for the U.S. and he decided to go back to Europe and then he went to the Delft for the, his Ph.D. working with uh, Leo Kovelovin and did a beautiful work on to the nanotube, uh, the uh, mesoscopic transfer study in the nanotube and uh, got the Ph.D. in 2004, five. Yeah. and then uh, uh, stayed there the one year of the short postdoc and decided to come back to the U.S and uh, came to Columbia University and did uh, another short term of the uh, postdoc uh, uh, post uh, research there. And then uh, within a year that he's, uh, we got stolen, uh, he, got, uh, he just moved to uh, uh, MIT to start his, uh, his own lab as assistant professor, um, uh, 2000, studying in 2008. <coughs> and uh, within 10 years, uh, he just promoted to the full professor this year. Uh, congratulations, Pablo. And um, in that uh, 10 years of the time period, he did a really amazing work. And um, it's basically uh, one of these uh, really pioneering work on the graphene and topological insulators. And more recently, that he, uh, the easy uh, research expand, uh, interest expanded to the uh, two dimensional interstructures. structures. Uh, very recent work, probably you're going to hear today, uh, that he demonstrated that this print is a two non superconducting materials, a simple material like the graphene, and with a kind of right angle, that suddenly it becomes a superconductor. Not only it is just a superconductor, it becomes a superconductor with correlated, correlated electron states. So I think this is a very exciting um, the, the new discovery that appears in the, uh, toward the end of the last year. And uh, already within a few months of the time frame, uh, in the last spring, the APS March meeting, the room uh, was completely packed and standing only, uh, all of, uh, only that will be uh, the presentation made in this uh, presentation by this meeting. So uh, I'm, uh, I'm very proud that he comes here, he come here and just give us uh, some chance to learn about the recent development in this room. Thank you. Thank you very much, Philip. So it's you know it's a pleasure always to be so you know Harvard I have so many friends here. What Philip forgot to say is that my postdoc at Columbia was in his group actually. So I'm a, I, I'm a, I'm a, my PhD uh, father or no my postdoc father. You know. I don't have any responsibility. You are saying something. Yeah. No. <laughs> Whatever you like or you don't like, he's partly responsible. You know. <laughs> Come back. So it's it's really a pleasure to be here, and I, I want to tell you, and you know, I know this is a, this is a, a talk for a mostly you know ultra cold atoms audience, you know. So I'll, I'll do my best. I think most of you know more than, about what I'm going to talk than I'm, than myself. So I'll do my best and, 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 and see. So I want to tell you about our recent experiments on magic angle graphene super lattices. Yeah. Now this is a a novel platform, and, and in order to introduce it, you know, I want to tell you about something that you know you all know very well, which is that among the most fascinating states of matter that we you know, that we can observe in physics are states of matter where there's very strong correlations among the fundamental constituents okay, that form these states. This is something for example that happens in the quark gluon plasma, okay, which you, you have just a few microseconds after the Big Bang, or you know, that you can recreate in heavy ion collisions, uh, you know, such as those at Brookhaven you know, National Laboratory. This is also something that happens in nuclear matter in neutron stars. Okay, and you know they have. The, the, I, I just took this image from Wikipedia. They, they call these different phases in, in of, of story correlated matter in nuclear stars. In neutron stars, nuclear pasta. So they have a Bucatini phase, a, a, a Lasagnan phase, etc. They're very creative in names. You know, I think we have to learn from them to to, to do PR on our things. And then something a little bit closer, perhaps, to to condense what the physics is. You know, fractional quantum hole states of matter where you can have, you know, quasi particles, you know, which have strange properties such as fractional charge and, and, and non-abelian statistics and, and many other things. Now, 
In incoherence matter physics, we, you know, a large fraction of the community is investigating strongly correlated quantum materials. And these are materials where the interactions between electrons are very strong, and they give rise to a variety of behaviors. One example is heavy fermions, where you can have that electrons have masses which can be hundreds or thousands of times those of the bare electron mass. You also have objects such as quantum spin liquids, you know, where your spins, you know, even as you cool down to zero temperature, they don't freeze, but are constantly you know, alternating, fluctuating, and they give rise to very interesting topological you know, behavior. And perhaps the, the, the most studied of the strongly correlated quantum materials are the high temperature superconductors. I took this diagram from one of Michael's uh, papers where, you know, in a, in a phase diagram of temperature versus, versus doping, you know, versus density, we, we have a variety of phases, very few of which we, we have a you know, thorough understanding about nowadays, you know, even after you know, decades studying them. So, I wanna, you know, in order to put everybody on the, on the, on the same page, and, and I'm mostly going to describe transport experiments, let me remind you from a transport point of view, you know, what are metals, insulators, and what are other things. Okay. So, if you take single particle band theory, an insulator, you know, you have a band which is, you know, here, and the density of states, this is a band, this is another band. If this is completely occupied, that means you have put as many electrons as you can possibly put in those states that form this band. And the next band, you know, is completely empty, the system is an insulator. You do not have available energy states at infinitesimal low energy where you can, by applying a voltage, just excite your electrons and have it conduct. Okay? This thing is called the band gap, this insulator, and you know, this is what you get. <coughs> On the other hand, one of these bands is partially occupied. Let's say, for example, you have your Fermi energy here in the middle of the band, because now you have available empty states for your electrons at very low energy. You can just apply voltage, those electron energy states can be occupied, and you can conduct electricity to your material. Okay? So this is a metal. And essentially, this is, these are the two only options if you have single particle physics. Okay? Now, sometimes we can have a situation which is more complex. Okay? There are occasions in which you know, your Fermi energy might, might be in the, in the, in the, you know, within a band, for example, in the middle of a band, and due to strong interactions between your electrons, you can recreate something similar to this. Yeah? These are called correlated insulators. Due to interactions between your electrons, you open a gap there, the correlated gap. And now, you know, your Fermi energy is there in the middle of this correlated <coughs> gap. So you recreate a situation which is similar to this. You have a band which is completely full, a band which is completely empty. Now these two bands appear because of correlations. And then you go to an insulator state. Okay? Now there are many examples of, of you know, correlated insulators. Perhaps the most famous is the mod insulator, which is related to the parent compound of the high temperature cuprate superconductors and you know, many other correlated materials. Okay? In this mod insulator, you know, in, in, sorry, in, this, in high DC cuprate superconductors, you have this copper oxygen planes, and you have that, you know, in, in each of these copper atoms you have one electron, you could put up to two electrons per copper atom, but you have only one electron, so you have half filled your band, okay, the band that, you know, is responsible for, you know, that the copper atoms you know, are responsible for, it's half filled because you have put half as, number, half as many electrons as you could put, and then this state is in a more insulated state, and as you dot now with holes, as you remove a few electrons in the system, an interesting game is played by the correlated motion of those electrons, you know, that try to jump from side to side, you know. These, more, these electrons, when, when you're completely, at, when you're exactly at half filling, are frozen because there's a penalty to doubly occupy one of these sides. So the electrons don't want to jump, you know, and be two electrons on one side because of strong long interactions. So this physics, which is, you know, believed to be described by the Howard model, how do you go from here to here, okay, as you empty now from electrons, you know, this game between available hoping now because there are some empty sites and penalty to doubly occupy some electrons is believed to be described by the Howard model and is to be, you know, believed to be responsible for this complex phase diagram that appears here. Now, However, this Hubbard model cannot be solved analytically. We do not know how to solve, I mean, theoretically, this Hubbard model exactly. So, for three decades now, after the discovery of high temperature cuprate superconductors, the community, especially the theory community, has been so a little bit stuck. Okay? And there's no consensus on, on the understanding of the different phases in the space diagram, particularly the you know, strange metal phase, pseudo gap phase, are particularly tricky to understand. Now, this, this sort of 
lack of progress, you know, theoretically towards a consensus towards these materials and other correlated materials has, uh, you know, it, it has uh, encouraged the, you know, you know, looking for alternative platforms where to investigate these strongly correlated materials. And one of the most successful you know, platforms, which is, I think, what, you know, as far as this conference uh, attendees are working on, is actually the field of, you know, ultra cold atoms in, in you know, in optical lattices, and to investigate solid correlated quantum materials in such optical lattices. So as you all know, this, you know, this 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 field, you know, already in, in 2002, the group of Immanuel Bloch, Marcus Greiner here, uh, was able to by tuning, you know, through you know the interaction between these atoms by you know by changing the depth of your, your potential well and changing the interaction through Fresnel resonance, was able to change into a superfluid and a multi state. This was done actually with bosonic atoms, so there was a realization of the bose haber model. A few years later, this was realized with fermions, so a realization of the Hermi haber <coughs> model. And the state of the art in this field, although I, I, you know, I, I know that at this conference people have reported uh, you know, extra, you know, the, the, even newer data, but you know, as far as I'm aware, you know, sort of this state of the art is that people have been able to demonstrate antiferromagnetism in this Fermi haber model. Okay. So you can load these atoms in an primitive atoms in an you know, optical lattice, and you can see that the spins you know, are you know, undercorrelated you know, over a certain distance. This is something that has been reported by several groups, you know, including a lot of work here at, at Harvard and also at MIT. I, I believe also uh, Basim and Martin you know, uh, told you during this conference about you know, linear T, you know, linear in temperature, uh, you know, transport properties and other things that are also similar to what happens in the strange metal phase. So basically, in this field of ultra-cold atoms, we're beginning to explore, you know, this corner of the phase diagram, moving also a little bit into this corner, okay? However, you know, something which would be very nice, which is to achieve, you know, this lower, you know, part of the phase diagram in particular, to achieve D-wave superfluidity, is something which, you know, hasn't been observed yet, and I believe that there are substantial, not, not unsurmountable, but substantial obstacles, substantial difficulties to cool down to low enough temperature in order to observe, to observe this. So we have you know, these two types of approaches to investigate the correlated quantum materials. One is look directly at the quantum materials themselves. Here, the natural length scale is of order of an Armstrong. And typical energy scales, depending on what you look at, are between you know, hundreds of kelvins and, and thousands of kelvins. In this field of ultra cold atoms, the typical separation between these atoms is about a micron, so it's about four orders of magnitude, larger separation. This leads naturally also to much more energy scales. The typical energy scale here is of order a nano kelvin. I wanna, what I want to tell you about today is a new platform. It's a magic angle graphene superlattices, and actually this is more general even than graphene, as I will mention later. Where the typical energy scale is the typical length scale is of order 10 nanometers, and the typical energy scale is of order one kelvin. So intermediate between these two approaches. Here we have very little control. Here we have almost absolute control over our system. This is also an in between. We have quite some degree, you know, some control, but not quite as much as the optical uh, as the you know, optical lattices, but much more than for quantum materials in general. So this is what I want to tell you about. Today, I want to tell you a little bit about 2D materials, you know, in case you're familiar with them, and the Legoland and the historics. Then, you know, I'll focus on graphene and magic angle graphene superlattices, then about our observation of correlated insulated behavior that calculated the superlattices, then about superconductivity, and a little bit about, you know, more recent stuff and, and an outlook <coughs> for the community. So let's start with this. So, you probably are aware that you know for the past you know, maybe 14 years or so, we, you know, that sort of a revolution you know happening in this matter when we were able to isolate you know 2D materials, you know 3D materials which are layered. We were able to isolate an individual sheet of these 3D materials, investigate its electronic properties. The thing that came next is that not only we can investigate the properties of each layer, but actually we realize that we can also because they are 2D, you know, we can just stack them on top of each other. And this led to these themes and these reviews, you know, by, you know, here you have Philip, you know, about this review, and the guy, and colleagues, this other one. These comparisons between 2D materials and, and Legoland, you know, you can, you know, you can stack these 2D material pieces on top of each other in a similar way to how you stack Lego pieces on top of each other. Now, my opinion, this emphasizes one rather unique property of 2D materials, the fact that you can stack anything on top of anything, okay? Now, 
if you have played with Lego, and I have small kids who so play with Lego all the time, you know, often my kids are pretty small, so they come and say, like, Daddy, I can't keep this thing on top of each other, you know. And that's because you have to have them perfectly aligned in order to stack the Lego pieces. Yeah? It's kind of just to rotate it. Yeah? In order for them to stick on top of each other, they have to be perfectly aligned. So this Lego comparison with Legoland is, is very powerful, but I think that it doesn't really tell you about the most unique aspect of 2D materials, which in my opinion is that you can do this. You can have two 2D materials on top of each other and stack them with an arbitrary angle of rotation between the two crystalline lattices. Okay? This is something that we can do completely at will and that is totally unprecedented <coughs> in the history of material science. Okay? You cannot do this when you grow bulk crystals. You cannot do this when you grow MB, you know, gold semiconductor or metallic heterostructures. When you grow these heterostructures, they like to grow, first of all, only some materials on top of some materials. You need some lattice matching. And the growth is always in a given crystallographic direction. Occasionally, you have defects. But you cannot just control and do this completely at will, as we can with 2D materials. We can put two sheets on top of each other at any angle that we want. 1 degree, 27, 56.4, anything that we choose. Yeah, we can do this. And as I'm going to show you today, this can lead to dramatic alteration changes in the electronic mm -hmm. structure of these materials and dramatic consequences for the phenomena that one can observe. So let me stop this thing you know, before you get a little bit dizzy. So let me tell you now a little bit about graphene and, and magic angle graphene super lattices. So I think most of you have probably heard talks about graphene. Graphene is a honeycomb lattice. Okay, it's a hexagonal lattice with a two atom basis. That's why I'm coloring these atoms green and red. You know? These atoms are identical, chemically identical, carbon, most of them, but crystallographically they are non equivalent. Okay? So they have, you know, it's a hexagonal lattice with, a, with two sub lattices, the A and B sub lattice, we call them. You can calculate the electronic structure of graphene in a simple time binding model, and you get this very unusual, near the Fermi energy, this very unusual. Dirac cones, they are called, where you have a zero band gap, you know, and you have here electrons in your conduction band, holes in your valence band, and the energy momentum relationship is linear. Okay? This, actually, this, this, you know, the equation that reflects this behavior is actually the Dirac equation in two dimensions for massless particles. And where, you know, in the usual Dirac equation, you have this spin up, which tells you about the spin up and spin down of the electrons. In the case of graphene, it tells you whether the electron wave function is on the A or the B sub lattice. Now, it is important to, you know, to remember for later on that we have two of these you know, double data cones, of this, they're called valleys, and they're called K and K prime valleys. So electrons in graphene have this you know, fourfold degeneracy, spin up and spin down, valley K, valley K prime. Okay? Remember just four for later. So now, what happens when you put two graphene sheets on top of each other? Okay? So when you put two graphene sheets on top of each other, a more pattern forms. And the wavelength of the Moray pattern, the distance between those soccer balls, if you look in the screen, depends on the twist angle between the two sheets. Because these are identical lattices, the Moray wavelength can go all the way to infinity. Okay? It grows very rapidly for small angles. Now, this is what happens in real space. Okay? Let's look at what happens in reciprocal space and what happens from an energetic you know, point of view. So we have graphene here. This is the reciprocal lattice of graphene, hexagonal, with the K and K prime valleys. Now I put another graphene sheet on top. The reciprocal lattices, if, if the you know, angle is zero between the two lattices, the reciprocal lattices are also aligned. Okay? So this, this is the uh, you know, first little one. So now if we rotate in real space the two graphene lattices, the reciprocal you know, spaces also rotate. So this leads to a separation in momentum space between the Dirac cones. Yeah? So the mode separation is proportional to the sign of the you know, half the angle, the twist angle. This means that for small angles, it's actually proportional to the angle. So this twist thing leads to layer Dirac cones separated in momentum space. And this was already you know, predicted a you know, long time ago and observed also you know, by you know, experimental you know, several people. Now, this is sort of a, a you know, so let's look at this a little bit more carefully. So I'm going to start now with two graphene sheets which are rotated by a small angle. So that the separation in momentum space you know, between the Dirac cones is proportional to the angle. And now I'm going to go towards smaller and smaller and smaller angle, and let's see what happens. So 
this is the situation that would happen if you know, these two Dirac cones are sort of interpenetrating each other. This is the energy momentum. If these two graphene sheets do not talk to each other. However, these two graphene sheets are just three angstroms apart. The electrons in one layer very much see the electrons in the other layer. In particular, they can tunnel between the layers. So in reality, a more accurate picture is this. At this crossing point, there is level repulsion, band repulsion, okay? And the strength of this interlayer interaction determines what is the strength of that band repulsion there. Now, this is the situation if this crossing point is, occurs at much higher energy than, uh, sorry, this crossing point occurs at much higher energy than the interlayer interaction. <coughs> If I now rotate my two graphene sheets towards smaller and smaller and smaller angle, these two Dirac cones are getting closer and closer and closer and closer. So the band repulsion occurs at lower and lower and lower energies. So what happens as you decrease the twist angle is that you go, you know, there is some angle for which the splitting is as big as the point where that crossing point is. So you develop a flat band condition. Okay? That lower band here gets pushed down all the way to zero if you get those two points closer and closer. Okay? This flat band condition is reached at an angle called the magnetic <coughs> angle. It happens to be 1.1 degrees, about 1.1 degrees for graphene. Okay? Two graphene sheets rotated about 1.1 degrees with respect to each other give you this flat band. This thing, you know, the flat band, was, uh, the magnetic angle term was coined by Bistris and McDonald. There were earlier calculations they got it a little bit off you know, by Suarez and Morel, but they already described this flat band condition. And there were STM experiments by the group of Ivan Dre and Rutgers that already saw there is a feature when you do scanning tunneling microscopy spectroscopy of, of this graphene sheet. There's a form of similarity which happens at that point, which they saw went to zero as you reach this 1.1 degrees. So there were already indications that something funny happens when you go towards 1.1 degrees. Now, this is a cartoon. Let me show you an actual calculation of what the electronic structure does. Okay? So, here we have the two you know, reciprocal spaces of you know, graphene sheet 1 and graphene sheet 2. If you join the corners of these two hexagons, you have the super lattice Lyrian zone, because you have a large, a long more wavelength in real space. In reciprocal space, you have a smaller super lattice Lyrian zone. And here is a video. I'm going to show you a video of the electronic structure as a function of you know, momentum, energy versus momentum, as we rotate the angle from a relatively large angle, 3 degrees, towards smaller and smaller angles. Yeah? As you can see, for 3 degrees within this energy window, it just looks like graphene. There are six Dirac cones. In reality, only two are independent. You know, the others are just you know, copies by reciprocal lattice vectors. Yeah? The first thing that you're going to notice is that as I decrease the angle, the super lattice Lyrian zone is going to become smaller and smaller and smaller. Again, as I decrease the angle, the more wavelength becomes larger, which means in momentum space, features become smaller. Okay? So let me run this video and show you. So, you see, now this electronic structure at 2 degrees is getting very modified, very modified. This set of bands is going to become a flat band at about 1.1 degree there, you see? And then it continues evolving. Okay? Now, because my students spend a lot of time working on this video, let me show it to you again. <laughs> so that you can appreciate. Okay? You see there are you know, these bands, these cell bands separated by gaps from the higher bands. This thing at 1.1 is going to become very flat. And then it continues evolving. Okay? So actually, the latest calculations suggest that if you include lattice relaxation in the x, y, and z direction of the graphene lattices, the magic angle is closer to about 1.05 degrees, but this is continuously evolving, this, this particular value of the magic angle. You, know, you get this flat band separated by gaps from the high energy bands, which are you know, strongly dispersive. So let me show you a cut. Yeah? This energy versus momentum. You know, these are the set of you know, flat bands there. And now think about this. Flat in momentum space, do the Fourier transform, means highly localized in real space. So if we look at you know, the charge density in these flat bands, where does it localize? You know, where does it show up in real space? Actually, it's strongly peaked okay? in regions called AA regions. Regions where they locally, it looks like all of the carbon atoms are on top of, you know, in one layer are on top of the carbon atoms in the other layer. Okay? These AA regions are tunnel coupled 
you know, with very little density of electrons through A, B, and B, A stacking regions, regions where the graphene lattices are offset a little bit. So, you know, if you want, what we have is something where you have these A, A regions where the electrons like to sit. They are separated by A, B, and B, A stacking regions. And in a, in a more, you know, pictorial, you know, way, these two regions, you know, these AA regions are separated by about 13.4 nanometers. And this is what it's going to constitute our triangular, triangular in quotes, because in reality it's actually a honeycomb lattice. You know, the AB and BA regions are not identical. So this is actually a honeycomb lattice. So Fermi Hubbard lattice, if you want, okay, where we're going to put electrons there. So let me start showing you some data. Now, before I show you data, let me tell you, you know, people are always very curious, how do you fabricate, you know, these 1.1 degree structures? So let me show you how we do this. So, we take a glass slide with a polymer stack, okay? And now we bring a substrate which has a piece of hexagonal boronite. Hexagonal boronite is a layer material which is an insulator. This happens to be a perfect substrate for graphene, okay? This is actually about 10 nanometers in thickness. So with this polymer, we pick up this hexagonal nitride. Now we bring a substrate with a monolayer graphene piece in there. Okay? This is by now completely standard. Thousands of groups around the world can do this thing. And we position this HVN halfway on top of the graphene sheet. And then we bring it down. And then we tear half of the graphene sheet. Okay? Let me show you how it looks now from the top. From the top now, I have my substrate. It has half of the graphene there. And then on the glass slide, I have the polymer, the hexagonal boronitride, and the other half of the graphene here. Because these two pieces came from the same graphene crystal, these are crystallographically aligned, even though they are displayed in C now. I can now rotate my substrate by some angle, in particular 1.1 degree, why not? Okay? I can then translate, put it on top of each other, and I can stack it. I then pick this up, and I can continue doing my fabrication. And amazingly, in this stack, all of the atoms are registered with respect to each other with this 1.1 degree rotation very accurately. Okay? It's kind of crazy that this thing you know, can be done nowadays. So now, not, not thousands of groups cannot do this. Only a few groups nowadays can do this. But it's, it's, it's no big secret. You know, people will do it you know, in time, everybody. So after you have this, this is standard technology to continue doing fabrication. And you make a device which looks like this. You have this double graphene sheet. It's twisted by any graphene. It has hexagonal boronite at the top and at the bottom. Because that protects it you know, and forms a very high quality dielectric. And then we have an electrode. I mean, we contact it with source and drain electrodes so that we can apply a voltage and run a current. We also have this gate electrode. It forms a parallel plate capacitor with the graphene so that we can vary the density or the Fermi energy in this graphene heterostructure. Okay? So let me show you some data. Now, just as a reminder, especially you know, because many of you are, are, are not uh, graphene experts, if you just measure the conductivity of graphene as a function of density, if your Fermi energy is deep in the balance band, you have lots of holes, so you conduct very well. If your Fermi energy is deep in the conduction band, you have lots of electrons, you also conduct very well. If your Fermi energy is at the charge neutrality or at the direct point, you don't have much carriers, so you conduct poorly. So when you measure graphene conductivity versus density or Fermi energy, you have this V-shaped behavior. Okay? That's for monolayer graphene. Let me show you what happens when you have these two layers of graphene. I'm going to show you first what happens if you have a large angle between the two layers, something like three degrees, okay? The conductivity versus density. Now, I'm normalizing now the density by the super lattice density, which means how many electrons I can put in these flat bands. And that happens to be four electrons per side. You know, spin up, spin down, valet K, valet K prime, as I told you earlier, four, yeah? So I'm just normalizing. I'll show you actual real axis and units in a moment. This is just for... So, again, because at 3 degrees, this just looks like graphene, the conductivity just looks V-shaped, like graphene. Okay? Even though these are two twisted layers. Now, I'm going to choose now an angle which is going to be small, 1.8 degrees, but not yet magic. Okay? If you measure the conductivity, you have this thing. Near charge neutrality, you have V-shape. Because near charge neutrality, this looks like graphene. But as you feel with electrons 
this part of the band. But as you empty with electrons or fill with holes this part of the band, at some point you reach a gap. Before you reach this gap, you go through an insulated state. Okay? Because you have charge carriers there to conduct. So you have this, you know, D-shaped conductivity in a charge neutrality, then it goes to an insulated state, that's when your Fermi energy is there. If you depopulate this band of electrons, you have you know, this insulated state when you reach that gap there. Okay? These gaps can be understood in a single particle picture. It just corresponds to filling your band okay? completely. Correlations affect these gaps and so on, but you know, to see the thought that these are just single particle gaps. Now let me show you what happens when you have a magic angle. Okay? So twisted by layer graphene, in this case it's for 1.08 degrees. Okay? So near charge neutrality is the blue trace. Near charge neutrality, you have V shape. Near full filling, you have these big gaps, so insulated state. But now look at this. At half filling, when your system should be a metal, because you have a band which is just half filled, okay? you turn out to have insulating states. Okay? And you know, this has been seen by now by many groups. So let me show you now real, you know, these are real conductance in, in millisiemens, real density of electrons in 10 to the 12 per centimeter square. Okay? Again, remember, this is charge neutrality. I'm putting electrons if I go in this direction. I'm adding holes if I go in this direction. We call this the correlated insulated state for electrons. This is the correlated insulated state for holes. Okay? Now, the first thing that we notice, you know, we very quickly realize that these, these, states, these insulating states are very different from any other insulated states we had seen before in graphene. You know, first thing that we notice is that these insulated states at half filling occur only for a very narrow distribution of angles of these two twisted layers, basically between 1 and 1.2 degrees. So 1.1 plus minus 0.1 degrees. Okay? If you're at 1.5 degrees, nothing. If you're at 0.8 degrees, nothing. Okay? In a very narrow distribution of angles, we can get this you know, type of correlated insulated behavior. The most peculiar thing, however, about these insulated states was the following. If we apply a magnetic field, the system goes from an insulator to a metal. Okay? So this is the conductance. Okay? Dark means insulator. We apply a magnetic field, and it goes gray or yellow, which means it conducts. Okay? This happens regardless of whether you apply the magnetic field in plane, you know, parallel to the two sheets, or perpendicular to the two sheets. The thing which is most surprising is that it happens when you apply the field perpendicular to the two sheets. For any other graphene experiment in the quantum hole regime, graphene on top of hexagonal boronite which exceeded some gaps, any single particle gap in graphene, you apply a magnetic field and you go from insulator to more insulator. If graphene is conducting, you go from metal to insulator. You never go from insulator to metal when you apply a magnetic field perpendicular to graphene. Okay? So then we realized that this was something very peculiar. And now, you know, to make the story short, because I wanted to show you some other data, the basic picture that we came up with is that, you know, in a single body picture, you have this set of, you know, these flat bands, you know, which have, you know, charge neutrality point. If we locate our Fermi energy in the middle here of either the conduction band or the balance band, the correlated gap opens. This correlated gap is actually made out of singlets. If you apply a magnetic field, the Zeeman effect polarizes the singlets, allows you to close this gap, and you start conducting. Yeah? So that's sort of the basic pictures, which is, you know, uh, backed up by several, you know, other measurements. And I should say that, you know, related mod-like insulator, you know, we call this a mod-like insulator in the sense that we observe it when we have filled these bands, but the actual nature, the precise nature of this correlated insulated state is, you know, subject of current investigation, and you know, there's no agreement yet among theories. Uh, another group, the group of Feng one at Berkeley, reported similar you know, they actually call them fully, like not insulators, on, on ABC trilayer graphene on hexagonal boronitrate. It also forms a water pattern with flat bands, and they were able to observe also correlated insulated behavior shortly after, after we reported our data. Now, let me show you what happens, you know, you know uh, if, if you go a little bit away from this insulated state. So I'll show you this data, yeah? and then, you know, we, we look, you know, we have, you know, let me remind you again. From here, in this direction, we have electrons. From here, charge neutrality, in this direction, we have holes. You know, we did, you know, we were doing this experiment, we were doing temperature dependence around this correlated electronic, you know, this correlated insulated state for electrons. We do temperature dependence of this thing, 
and we don't see too much. You know, we, we respect the typical behavior. You know, if you cool down, the thing conducts less, like an insulator does. Then if we look around the correlated holes, we saw the following. For the insulating state itself, indeed, you cool down, it conducts less, as expected. However, right next to it, there was this big enhancement of the conductance. You know. And we were like, hmm, what's going on here? Now, these data that I'm showing here, these are two terminal data, meaning the graphene sheet is contacted only by two electrodes. Yeah? This is a good measurement configuration if you're trying to measure an insulator. Because when you're measuring an insulator, you don't care that you have some additional contact resistance from your electrodes. You know, if you're going to measure an insulator, who cares? Oh, and a little bit serious resistance. But if you want to measure if something conducts very well, and in particular if something might be a superconductor, you don't want that serious resistance. You want to do measurements in what is called a four terminal geometry. Okay? So when my students you know, show me this thing, I told them, let's make four terminal devices. Let's see how well does it want to conduct this thing. So we fabricated, you know, essentially the same tricks, you know, we just did a, you know, the, the, you know, a whole bar geometry so that we can run a current and measure the voltage and avoid, you know, contact resistance issues, yeah? Now, we first characterized samples in a two-terminal geometry because it's simpler. So let me show you, this is a new device, 1.16 degrees, the other one was 1.08, yeah? this is 1.16 degrees, conductance to terminal versus density, yeah? Now you can see here, this corresponds to the, uh, this is a charge neutrality. This is an insulated state when I put four electrons per super lattice unit cell, or four holes per super lattice unit cell. And we have here these dips near two and minus two, okay? This is in the presence of a small magnetic field, <coughs> perpendicular to the graphene sheets. If I now reduce the magnetic field to zero, you see, around the correlated electrons, not too much happens, but around the correlated holes, a lot happens. So now we switch to four terminal measurement configuration, and what we discovered is that twisted by the graphene, magic angle twisted by the graphene superconducts. Okay? These are data for two devices, 1.16 and 1.05 degrees. The resistance goes to zero. It decreases by two, three orders of magnitude below our measurement you know, uh, noise floor. You can also just current bias the device and measure the voltage. You see this flat, you know, you have you know, finite current bias, zero voltage shock. This unambiguously tells you that you have indeed a superconductor. Okay? You can do any test of two-dimensional superconductivity that you want to do. It you know, behaves like a 2D superconductor. And in fact, because I told you that we can control the density of electrons with this gate voltage, with this parallel <coughs> capacitor, we can do this. We can zoom in around here and now measure the resistance of our device as a function of temperature and density. Okay? What you see is this red region is the correlated insulated behavior. We put you know, remember, this is the correlated insulated behavior for holes. We add a few more holes, and we have a large superconducting dome. We remove a few holes, or we add some electrons, equivalently. We have a smaller superconducting dome. And then when, you know, when we saw this, you know, we were really, you know, really surprised. Because this is, you know, I don't remember how many hundreds of times I have seen pictures like this. Okay? This comes from a review by Andrea Marcelli and collaborators. This is the phase diagram for high temperature superconductors. At half filling, here it says dopant concentration zero, but zero means one electron per side. This is half filling of the band. You have a mode insulator. You add holes, and you have a superconducting dome. You add electrons, you have another superconducting dome. Now, these axes are opposite to this. Let me flip them. I don't know why they float them in the wrong direction. Let me <laughs> flip them here so that you see it properly. Okay? This is electron doping. You have a small superconducting dome, hold open, you have a much bigger superconducting dome. Now, big difference is the following. In order to do this with high temperature cooker superconductors, you, each data point in this diagram is a different growth of a different crystal. Yeah? And in particular, also to explore this, and to explore this, you have to grow different material classes, because not all materials can be doped with electrons and holes. And in fact, not all materials can be doped over this entire range, either for electrons or for holes. So you have to do hundreds and even thousands of growths in order to populate this phase diagram. We can go from here to here in a few seconds with our gate voltage, which is dialing it enough. Okay? So in a single sample with a single disorder realization. Now, we can do this for you know, other devices. These are the data for 1.05 degrees. Okay? 
most of our devices actually look like this, where the asymmetry between, elect, you know, between holes and electrons is very dramatic. Yeah? This is the one where we have seen that it's the most symmetric. Particularly this device, closer to 1.05 degrees, which seems to be closer to the actual magic angle, these things are much higher. In this case, about 1.7 Kelvin. Now we're all, you know, almost very close to 3 Kelvin, actually, for our highest DC devices. Now, this is a superconductor. You can apply a magnetic field and kill superconductivity. You can measure the resistance as a function of temperature and magnetic field. You know, you can, you know, this superconductor is this two-dimensional. You can apply a very large in-plane critical field because it's two-dimensional before you kill superconductivity. Okay? That's quite interesting. And in fact, you can do all of this continuously, again, because we have this gate voltage control over this. Okay? It's very deep perpendicular in density and resistance. You have these two superconducting you know, domes, but in magnetic field. Now, when, I, when the students showed me this data, I was like, hmm, you know, that looks beautiful, but not as beautiful as the other ones. You know, what's all this noise? What's up, what's up with all this noise? What's all this crap? You know? Actually, that thing is not noise. It turns out that if you pay attention, this thing actually is periodic. It turns out that when you park your gate voltage at the intersection between the superconductor and the insulator, the system doesn't know what to do. Should I go superconducting? Should I go insulator? What does it do? It breaks up into islands, superconducting and insulating islands. So if you measure, actually, you know, the critical current as a function of perpendicular magnetic field, you have Fraunhofer-like oscillations, okay, which tell you that you're looking at Josephson effect through the islands you know, that form at the boundary between the superconducting and the insulated region. We can, for the most, you know, for most cases, we can just model these Fraunhofer patterns with, you know, a squid where you have two islands that, you know, dominate your Fraunhofer pattern, you know, either symmetric or asymmetric islands, and we can model the squid. Reality will be, of course, much more complex. There will be some kind of superconducting percolation, you know, through some weak links. Now, the thing gets even better because graphene is a very clean system. You know, compared to, you know, cuprates or nick times where mid paths are like order, you know, a few nanometers, because there's a lot of disorder because of the chemical doping. This, we haven't introduced any chemicals here. You introduce the charge, the doping, you know, just by gate voltage. So we can measure quantum oscillations at relatively small magnetic fields compared to the cuprates. <coughs> so this is the resistance, you know, longitudinal resistance is a function of density and perpendicular magnetic field, now over a large magnetic field range. Okay? The charge neutrality point is here. So, and, and, and here is the superconducting dome that you can see in near zero magnetic field. This is the, so this is the charge neutrality point. This is the single particle insulator state. This is the correlated insulator state at half filling. And what you can see here, you know, I don't want to describe the details because it's quite complex. The contrast is tuned so that you can see this fine diagram. Yeah, you have quantum oscillations, you may call the has oscillations that come out of different points in this color plot, okay? In particular, these two fan diagrams come from this region here, from the higher you know, dispersive band, and this near charge neutrality. This one comes from this correlated insulated state. And without going into too many details, there are two things which are pretty you know, sort of surprising or, or you know, unexpected. One is the fact that you observe a fan diagram stemming out of this correlated insulated state at all. Okay? The fact that it comes from here, rather than from here, tells you that the Fermi surface that forms when we start doping this correlated insulated state is a small Fermi surface. Okay? If you, you know, for those of you familiar with you know, the, the field of the cuprates, you know, there is this unknown thing that happens for other doped cuprates where the Fermi surface is very small. So you have already one electron per site. When you add electrons, your Fermi surface should be the big one, 1 plus x, where x is the doping. But no, it's just X. This is more for the surface. We see the exact same thing here. Yeah? There is like a resetting of your density, even though you're forming a Fermi surface. The same forgets that it has all of those you know, have populated that. Then the other thing which is strange is that you know, if you look at this, the slopes of these lines, yeah, you can detect what is the degeneracy of your lambda levels in your system. And for the lambda form diagram that comes out of charge neutrality and out of this you know, highly dispersive you know, point, you have fourfold degeneracy, which again, spin up, spin down, valley k, valley k prime, why not? Yeah? However, for the fine diagram that comes out of this correlated insulated state, the degeneracy is two. Somehow we have had the degeneracy that we had before. Yeah? 
And although we do not understand this, there are a number of theories in the field of high temperature reciprocal conductivity which tells you that you're supposed to have in these small Fermi surfaces you know, spin charge separation and a halving of the number of your degrees of freedom, the special quasi particles with half the number of the degrees of freedom. Yeah. We don't know these apply to our system, but it's you know sort of you know we're very interested to see that this thing happens here. Now so okay, so how strong a superconductor is this twisted by linear graphene? Yeah? Now, on one hand, Tc is about 1 Kelvin, you know, so not very high, right? However, you don't usually compare, I mean, I'm talking to ultra-cold atoms, but it's, it's actually super high, right? <laughs> but, you know, you don't compare usually just Tc between different superconductors if you want to know if the superconductor is strong or not. What you do is, okay, how many carriers do I have in my system contributing to the superconductivity? What's my Fermi energy? What's my density of electrons so contributing to superconductivity? And what TC do I get? Okay? This is something that can be plotted in, in something which is called a Euler plot. This is very similar to a Euler plot, this particular plot. This is actually taken by a paper called Euler. Where well, you have in a log log scale, you have critical temperature and you have Fermi temperature. Okay? I'm here putting data points from 2D and from 3D, they are normalizing factors and so on. You know, I think a lot of you are, are experts on this. So you know what I'm talking about. Now, for example, aluminum has Tc of 1 Kelvin, okay? but it has a Fermi temperature of 100,000 Kelvin. Okay? So given how many and how many electrons aluminum has, it doesn't really superconduct that strongly. Okay? Most conventional superconductors are in this region. As you move towards this region, you go more and more unconventional. Okay? This blue band that you can barely see, there is a, there is a, there is a blue band here, uh, the projector is not showing it, has a lot of unconventional superconductors. For, here you have, for example, here you have cuprates, here you have heavy fermions, here you have the nictites, here you have the organics. I also put a few points for, for cold atoms, you know, lithium-6, potassium-40, multiply both axes by 100 million so that they would appear, but they're very strongly coupled superconductor uh, you know, systems, you know, as you know, okay? So, where is magic angle to the layer of thing? Happens to be there, okay? Other than the cold atoms, is one of the strongest superconductors that we are aware of. Yeah? It is actually only surpassed by iron selenide monolayer and STL, which is a very high you know, temperature and low density superconductor. The thing happens to be, by the way, by order of the, you know, by an order of magnitude and more, the lowest density two dimensional superconductor that exists. Yeah? Actually, close to two orders of magnitude. And of course, all of this, the coupling is tunable because we have this gay voltage, the capital is still. Now, there are many, many questions that, that, you know, that remains about this, and this was the first experiment, right? The thing that most people ask me is, what is the origin of this correlated insulated state, and what is the superconducting orbit parameter? And you know, just in case you haven't been paying attention to the archive, this is a partial list, you know. I stopped, I stopped updating this list as when I saw that the phone was getting too small to, to show it to people, you know. But this, you know, by now there are actually about 100 papers or so. A lot of people just addressing these particular two questions, and there are many papers addressing other things, okay? But just these particular questions, and there are all kinds of proposals, you know. The, the favorite order parameter is D plus IV, closely followed by P plus IP, but there is also S, there is also D plus, S plus P plus D. I saw one paper where it was S plus P plus D plus F, so, you know, I don't know how many letters we're going to keep going. But for me, this is actually quite surprising. I come from this field of graphene where, you know, the, the theories agree, disagree, but the disagreements are not major, you know. It's not like shooting all directions. Like, this, to me, I was like, you know, I read one paper, I'm like, finally, I understand it. And it's like, hmm, this paper says absolutely opposite of this one, and they both look sound, you know. So I'm a little bit lost, you know. So <laughs> let me just point out that there is this, you know, so the, the, the gates, you know, the flood gates opened just three weeks after our paper was posted. Senke Shu and Leon Balins, they had seen actually, you know, I had shown them the data, so they had a few extra weeks to calculate. But anyway, just three weeks after our paper was published, they posted, you know, it takes two years to do the study, and it takes three weeks to do the theory, so. <laughs> <laughs> I was worried they were going to post before, you know, we, we had posted that one. So, um, but then the second paper was this paper by Gregory Bolovic who is a you know, very famous Russian theorist working in, in, in Denmark, 
who sent, he also sent us an email and said, finally someone has done everything that I predicted. That's okay. A lot of theories wrote that kind of email to me, you know. So it's okay. Finally, you have confirmed everything I predicted. That's okay. But what he said is, is kind of interesting. It turns out that since the 50s, there have been these reports about once per decade, more or less, of very high temperature superconductivity, including room temperature, in graphite. These are not very reproducible. The first paper was in nature, by the way, in the 50s. Not very reproducible. People were very doubtful. This looks weird, blah, blah, blah. In 2014, so a few years ago, Malovic published a paper and he said, all of these experiments have been done in graphite, which is turbostatic graphite. Graphite where there is small misorientation between the crystalline structures of the graphene plates. If you get these misorientations, you're going to reach a condition of flat bands. And there will be correlated superconductivity, and you will have you know, very high temperature superconductivity. So you know, I used to think those experiments were crazy. Now I'm like, I don't know. Yeah, who knows? Maybe. You know? So basically, Morovic said, you know, since there's an email and says, you know, finally control experiment in two layers. Now, do, 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 make many and make room temperature. Come on, we're waiting for you. So we'll see. Okay? We, we, you know, this is something that uh, remains to be explored. You will publish that. Yeah, you can publish it. Yeah, yeah, of course. So, now let me give you a little bit of an outlook, okay, in the last, yeah, the last five, ten minutes. So, you know, we published this paper, uh, you, know, they, it, it, you know, the paper was published by Nature, the two papers in Nature, uh, right at the beginning of the March meeting, so that was very nice, the coincidence of the two events. So what has happened since March, okay? Well, so the first thing is that we have reproduced our own results. That's always good, you know, that you can reproduce yourself, you know. No, not that you laugh, but not everybody does it, okay? So it's good. We've reproduced it ourselves many times, in fact, okay? We have a selection of, of a few devices, but now we have about 12, 15 devices we have measured superconductivity. In fact, we're starting to map out what is critical temperature at optimal doping versus twist angle in 0 0.01 degrees, because it changes on 0 0.01 degrees, you know? So, and, and you know, even better, sorry? The highest temperature is for 1.03. Yeah, so 1.03, one, the largest here is 1.03. We have now one which is a little bit larger, 1.02. You, know, you know, I'm not sure we know the data that we have. Now, even better that you're reproducing yourself is that someone else reproduces your data, okay? So as of a few weeks ago, a group led by Corey Dean at Columbia University in collaboration with Andrea Young at UCSB, they have completely independently with you know, we didn't share anything with, you know, they, they their own fabricated devices, their own measurements, they have completely reproduced our results, and they have even extended them, yeah? So they were able to measure magic angle devices and measure superconductivity. The thing that they did to extend our results is the following. Remember that I told you that this flat band condition depends on this interlayer coupling. You know, when this interlayer coupling, you know, is, you know, strong enough that, you know, where the crossing point of the beta cones happens, then you have this flat band condition. If your angle is very large, then you will not develop this flat band condition. But if you increase your interlayer coupling, in particular, if you apply pressure between the two sheets, so that electrons in both layers see each other better, then that interlayer coupling is enhanced. <coughs> so what they did here is they put, they made a device with 1.27 degrees, they measure it, no superconductivity, no correlated insulated states, nothing. Then they apply pressure to it, and the right pressure, such that they could reach the flat line condition, and they measure superconductivity, correlated insulated states, etc. Yeah? In fact, the pressure that they had to use agrees perfectly well with the prediction by my colleague, you know, Tim Kaxira, they were very generous to include this in this theory paper, where they predicted what will be the magic angle, you know, as a function of pressure you know, in the system. An experiment that was done you know, just you know, a few months later agrees perfectly with the theoretical prediction. Yeah? So it's very clear that this physics that is happening here is completely related to the presence of those flat bands. So this, is, you know, this was very exciting. I was very happy that also my friends, you know, so the fact that you get reproduced by your friends is, is, is great. Now, we had a lot of, you know, in our own group, we're exploring a lot more physics that, you know, happens in these systems, okay? We have superconductor insulator transition and metal insulator transition type of physics in the systems. There's a vast literature 
uh, about this type of physics in correlated materials. Moreover, we have this linear resistivity behavior which occurs for many correlated materials that have this strange metal phase. Yeah? And very recently, it has been discovered that this, in this strange metal phase, many correlated materials exhibit this thing called Planckian dissipation. Yeah? This linear T resistivity has a slope which is given by fundamental constants, you know, times temperature. Our resistivity, okay, these are data at zero magnetic field, these are when you kill superconductivity with small magnetic field. At high temperatures, we have this linear resistivity behavior, okay? This goes all the way to about the Fermi temperature in our system, okay? Let me show you one of our latest devices. There's 1.03 degrees with a TC of 2.5 Kelvin at 50% of master resistance. You can see this is a straight line superimposed on top. This is very much linear. And if you calculate the prefactor for samples where we have been able to measure quantum oscillation of the effective mass, so that you can calculate the prefactor, it's within a factor of two of this Planckian dissipation rate. Yeah? Again, no theory, the theories do not understand this Planckian dissipation, where it comes from, but we just have to have it here too. Another feature which is observed in many correlated materials is the maticity and isotropies of your superconductive parameter or also in the normal state. Electronic, you know, your electronic system breaks rotational invariance. Okay? So it happens actually also in graphene. Okay? This is one of these devices where you know, this is the dome for holes, this is the dome for electrons, this is the insulated state. You can measure the superconducting state. If you measure the resistance, you know, very close to the superconducting transition, this is finite because we're kicking the system, starting to kick out the system out of the superconducting state. It has this twofold anisotropy, okay? It has two bumps. Now this system is hexagonal, okay? So it has three axes, the crystallographic directions are three axes. The system chooses one direction, so it forms an ellipse. Two bumps means an ellipse. Let me show you the ellipses. It forms an ellipse, okay? So the system, you know, could choose any of these three directions, but chooses one direction, you know, and exhibits anisotropy in the critical in-plane magnetic field. Okay? And of course, we can do all of this as a function of temperature, gate voltage, explore the underdope, the overdope regime, etc. We sometimes see that this ellipse flips by 120 degrees, okay? Because with gate voltage, it chooses a different domain, okay? The domain changes. We also have an isotropist, not in the critical magnetic field, but in, the, in a related quantity, in the critical current. So we can take these videos as a function of density, you know, and you can see those anisotropies, okay? I'm not going to run this twice. Let me just show you a summary here. If you measure the critical current as a function of parallel magnetic field direction, orientation of the parallel magnetic field, we actually see these sort of two critical currents. Okay? And they oscillate. It's an ellipse also. It has two maxima. Okay? But as you can see, these two critical currents, the maxima between these two critical currents, are separated in angle by 120 degrees. Which is what you would expect if you're seeing some kind of domain switching of this pneumatic behavior in the system. So we're still analyzing some of this data. And now, the other thing that we have seen is that we now see also superconductivity around the correlated electron states. So now we have four domes around the holes, hole doping, electron doping, around the electrons, hole doping, electron doping. Okay? So, if, you know, now, here is charge neutrality. I've been showing you data mostly from charge neutrality in this direction. Now I'm showing from charge neutrality in this direction. Okay? These are the correlating insulated state for electrons. We have here a very small superconducting dome, and here it wants to be superconducting. It doesn't fully do it. This is a log scale. Let me show you the traces. Here for electrons, you have superconducting state, applies more magnetic field, it goes away to superconducting state. For holes, that's a quite bit zero, but it wants to become superconducting. Now, where does this go? Okay? Is this just graphene on graphene or is this more general? Actually, it happens that any 2D material placed on top of itself, you will be able, by you rotate, and depending on the coupling, you will be able to realize a magic angle condition, okay? where you will have either flat bands everywhere in momentum space or locally in certain regions of momentum space, depending on the coupling, you will have flat bands. And since we now have all of the condensed matter behaviors in 2D materials, in model layers of 2D materials, okay, we have metals, semi-metals, Dirac, topological insulators such as WT2 and others, model layers. We have also insulators like HVM, we have semiconductors like the 2H, 
transition metal decalcogenes. We have superconductors themselves, which are also two-dimensional, nylonsolenite, tantalum disulfide, high temperature coupons are layered materials, and you can isolate them in monolayer form too. You have, since recently, magnets and even quantum spin liquids, which are two-dimensional. Now, you can stack this on top of the angle, and you will introduce correlations if not many correlations were present, like in the case of protein, or modify existing correlations if they were present there. Okay? So there's a zoo of possibilities, yeah? and many other theory papers which I have not shown are actually now predicting what is the magic angle for transition metal like protein and A on top of this other. In fact, you know, so, so you know, you know, many magic angles have been predicted for various transition metal decalogenites, but people are even realizing that you don't even need, if the material already has some correlations in it, you don't even need to reach the magic angle. It's just enough to have this low twist angle and these moiety patterns where charges like to localize, if they are already a little bit interacting, to give you correlated phenomena, even without the magic angle, okay? Just by low twist angle, okay? you are able to do, you know, realize, you know, many versions of the Hubbard model with, you know, many different characteristics. Okay? Not only you can do correlated physics, you can actually induce very interesting type of topological physics in these flat bands. Okay? And there are papers, you know, by my colleague, you know, Santel and many others which are predicting electric field tunable topological properties of these heterostructures. So, with this, I want to end, you know, of course, this is, you know, this is uh, you know, perhaps the most important slide. This is work done by, you know, a large group of people. Key person is my graduate student, Yuan Sa, okay, which continues to measure. Working very closely with Bala Fatemi and for some of the more recent measurements with Daniel Kudan and Grain. There are other people, you know, other graduate students and visitors, and my colleague, Ray Ashuri, also has contributed to this work. At Harvard, we have uh, benefited enormously from you know, theoretical calculations by Xiang Fang and Tim Kaxuris. We also enjoy our collaboration with the Japanese who provide the example of the matter. And I want to thank you for your attention. Something sensitive to the magnetic field. 
We're trying to do some resistivity measurements in the normal state, and we have some indications that there might be an isotropy there, but the type of an isotropies are very different uh, above the superconducting dome and the correlated insulated region. So it could be that we have a mixture of both, and the purely pneumatic superconductor in certain regions, and the elasticity in the normal states in different regions, and the other parameter actually would have to change between these two. This has been seen in some correlated materials, that the only parameter changes, for example, from S plus D to D in, in iron selenide with sulfur. So all of this you know, is still too early to, to tell. <coughs> I want to come and have your postdoc. I should have just done it. Oh, uh, I do instantly. Um, so amazing, amazing results. One possibly completely naive question. Uh, I think you control the carrier potential, right? Yes. Yeah. But not the density. So how do you get the density, which is the x-axis for all your plots? Yeah. No, what we, what we actually control is the, the now that we have is a voltage yeah. on a parallel plate capacitor. That voltage is telling you what is the density induced in the metallic plate of your parallel plate capacitor. Now, in the other plate, usually you have the opposite charge you're forming the parallel plate capacitor. Okay? Now, it's true that you know, when you get to an insulated state, charge cannot go in. So what, what, what am I showing there? So the density that I'm showing is always the density on the metallic plate of my parallel plate capacitor. Okay? In the graphene, this leads to a change in Fermi energy. But of course, if you have a gap, the Fermi energy has to discontinuously jump, right? Now, in practice, there's disorder and things so that you do not jump discontinuously. You go slowly and fill the solder in the gap. Now, we can measure the density of the graphene sheet independently by doing whole measurements. Yeah? So we have those data too. So the density plot you know, that, I'm, you know, that I'm showing is the density on this metallic plate. The density in the graphene itself is not the same. And in particular, what happens is, let me show you, let me see, uh, any, any of these, let me see, for example, any of those, here, is this density? Yeah, any, yeah, let me see. For example, at this point, here I'm telling you density in 10 to the 12. Actually, when we measure with whole density, what is the density of charge value in the graphene itself, is much smaller. It goes close to zero here because you're in the correlated insulated state. And that's how I know that the Fermi energy is very small because the amount of carriers that are contributed to the superconductivity is of order 10 to the 11. It starts, it gets reset here, which is what I mentioned. You know, the Fermi surface grows from there. And that Fermi surface that grows from there that we measure with the pseudo carter oscillations agrees with the whole measurement data. It tells us independently what's the density of carriers there and it's very, very small. Okay? So here I'm just showing what are we doing, you know, with that metallic plate? But the actual density in the graphene, you know, oscillates, grows, and then it resets to zero, then it grows, then it oscillates to zero, then it grows again. YBCU at least, quantum oscillations are seen everywhere, you know, both for, for underdog and overdog. So also in the region where you have strange metal behavior in the highest quality YBCU samples. What happens in the Cooper's is the most samples are too dirty to see quantum oscillations. Some people say you just don't have Fermi surface because of exotic physics. That's why you don't see them. But the truth is that when you make the systems cleaner, people do see quantum oscillations. Um, in our case, we do see them in the, you know, this at, at high temperatures, okay? Mm -hmm. At temperatures above which we see this linear T behavior, what happens is that your quantum oscillations die, okay? So, you know, do you see them? No, but you, know, but you could argue that it's because of a trivial effect, you know, temperature dependence of the quantum oscillations, which die quickly in temperature, okay? Because the effective mass is relatively high compared to the usual graphene, very low electron effective mass. So I'm not sure that I would I could draw much conclusions from this. Right, probably. Maybe I just said I didn't get it. So the, the temptation I computed the magic angle? Yes. The fact. They predicted the magic angle. The magic angle there was a prediction for what the value of the magic angle would be flat band. They didn't predict superconductivity or anything like that, but they predicted the angle. Yes. So is this magic angle 
No, it's a family actually. Okay, it's a family of magic angles. So, in the simplest theory, now there's more advanced theory that is starting to change, but in the simplest theory, there's a series of magic angles that go as 1 over n, or an integer. So you have a 1 at 1.1, 1 .1, another 1 at 0 0.55, another 1 at 0.27, etc. They go as 1 over n. The band between, as I showed you in the video, once the band becomes flat, then it evolves into more complex structure, then it goes flat again, then complex structure, then flat again. So it's a series of magic angles. Is there any special property? Uh, it goes as one over n, you know. Yes, so, so. yes there is. Huh? Well, yes, there is some, some, some again. No, no, it's, there is actually a very strong periodicity. Yeah. Although this, again, for example, now I know work by Ashwin, maybe you are called for this paper, you know, they have changed completely the values of the higher magic angles, you know, based on, you know, interesting physics. So this is evolving quickly, yeah. So how low in terms of angles you can currently go? Philip has done experiments going down to 0.1 degrees through ultra long more patterns. Now, what happens in these ultra long more patterns is that you know the electrons, uh, the the, the graphene sheets are almost exactly what they would like to be, which is crystallographically aligned. And there's a strong tendency to relax the atoms into that crystallographic zero degree orientation. It's called AB stacking. And then, of course, you have to accumulate the strain in some regions, you know, to release the strain in some regions. So, for this magic angle, the first magic angle, that relaxation is not very big. Yeah? But for much smaller angles, that relaxation is very big, and it changes quite dramatically the electronic structure. All right. I have a small right. Last one. Yeah. Personal question about experimental setup. So, you have the hexagonal core of nitrite, and on top of it, like the uh, twisted ball and Mm -hmm. So if I just take the hexagonal boron nitrite and put just one layer of graphene without any twist, yep. it will be also more and better because of the lattice yep. message. Does it somehow affect your experience? So we, on purpose, so this is yes for the, the cold atoms uh, community that may not be familiar with this. It turns out that if you put just graphene, one layer, on top of hexagonal boron nitrite with zero degree rotation between the two crystalline lattices, hexagonal boron nitrite is also honeycomb, very similar to graphene. If you put them on top of each other without any rotation, it turns out that a band gap occurs at the charge neutrality point, and a modification of the electronic structure occurs at high energies. We measured this a number of years ago. The signature that these are aligned is the opening of the gap at the charge neutrality point. In our structures, we on purpose misalign the graphene and the HVM. We do not see any opening of a gap at the charge neutrality point, so we know that they are misaligned so that we do not introduce additional complications. Now, it would actually be very interesting and for topological properties and for many other reasons to try to actually align them. Yeah? Because then you would have already correlations at the charge neutrality point because the electron would not be massless, but they would be already a little bit massive. So it would be very interesting to do it, but you know, it requires you know, additional fabrication and a little bit extra complication, but it would be very interesting to do it. All right, with that, let's thank the speaker for the